Hello, uh, welcome to today's Type Directors Club virtual salon. My name is Carrie Hamilton. To introduce Dan McManus and Sophia Cara of the Narrative in Chicago to talk about Mies typography and the rebrand of 900 910 Lakeshore Drive. Take it away. Uh, thank you so much and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today and uh, thank you very much to the Type Directors Club, especially Carol for all of her hard work and the One Club for creativity uh, and of course Ashley Lukasik of Murmur Ring for making this happen. Uh, my name is Dan McManus and this is my partner Sophia Karash. Uh, we are The Narrative, a communication design studio located in the Ravenswood uh, neighborhood of Chicago. Uh, since 2012, we have worked with companies, organizations, nonprofits, cultural institutions, and individuals in diverse fields and disciplines to create meaningful and distinct visual narratives. On this project, we collaborated closely with Trinita Logue, uh, the president of the 900-910 board and with the 900-910 architecture committee, uh, Don Curtis, Timothy Kent, and Dave Pickard. Um, their dedication and love for these buildings made all of our work possible. Um, we'd like to start off by providing a little context about 900-910 and the building's architect, Mies van der Rohe. Uh, 90910 Lakeshore Drive are located in the Streetville neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, they're right on Lake Michigan and a short walking distance from many cultural, historic, and commercial treasures like the uh, John Hancock Building, Museum of Contemporary Art, and Michigan Avenue's Magnificent Mile. Um, they stand next to their predecessors, 86880, built by Mies five years earlier. Um, 86880 Lakeshore Drive are also known um, as uh, are on the register of historic places and designated as uh, Chicago landmarks and are also a twin uh, pair of glass and steel apartment towers, as you can see here. Here we see uh, Mies uh, dapper as ever on a rooftop with 86880 as his backdrop. Um, what is incredible is that the design principles he first expressed in the Friedrichstrasse skyscraper project in 1921, uh, pictured here on the left, were finally able to be realized in 86880 and 90910 in mid-century Chicago. In 1937, uh, frustrated and unhappy with the Nazi occupation, uh, he reluctantly left his homeland for Chicago. Um, Mies accepted an offer uh, to head the Department of Architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, there he introduced a new kind of education and attitude, later known as Second Chicago School, which became very influential um, in the following decades, bo both in North America as well as in Europe. Um, we could uh, talk about all the fascinating things we learned about Mies all day, uh, but we'll highly recommend uh, this book uh, called Mies van der Rohe, a critical biography, uh, the new and revised edition by Franz Schultz and Edward Windhorst. It's um, very comprehensive and insightful if you're interested in learning more. Uh, before beginning any design, we followed a thorough research process. Uh, first, it was important for us to conduct interviews. Um, it was important that we speak with a wide range of people who could enlighten us and share their perspectives and insights about 90910. Uh, the, build it, the buildings always drew interesting people to them, uh, many of them creative people, and part of our job was to collect and interpret their stories. Uh, we met with a diverse representation of 90910 from longtime residents to security personnel. Um, we interviewed residents who are architects and designers, board members, as well as real estate experts. Um, we also spoke with Mises grandson, Dirk Lohan, um, and architect Margaret McCurry, who was kind enough to sit down with us and share her and late husband Stanley Tigerman's insights um, on Mies architecture and living at 90910. Uh, this is the apartment of Brigitte Peterhans. Uh, meeting and interviewing her was a special treat. Uh, Brigitte studied with Mies at IIT. Uh, she met Myron Goldsmith, also an architect at a youth hostel in Europe, who told her about IIT and helped her come to Chicago from Germany uh, to study with Mies. Uh, she married Walter Peterhans, who was a teacher of photography at the Bauhaus before moving to Chicago to teach at IIT. And she made her career at SOM, working on significant buildings like the Hand Cock and Sears Tower. Uh, her apartment is pristine Nice. Uh, it houses a few pieces of original 1920s Berlin furniture designed both by Nice and other members of the Bauhaus that Walter Peterhans uh, brought with him from Germany. 
Um, when uh, we inquired what Mies was like as a teacher, uh, Brigida said he was very unique, that he would come and look at your project for a long time without saying anything at all. Um, so you would sit there uh, awkwardly for 10 minutes or longer and he would not say a word. And in that time you would see everything that was wrong with your work. Um, he might then ask a few questions, but didn't really say much. We also asked Brigida about Misa's relationship to color and she shared an interesting anecdote with us that to be honest, I became a little bit obsessed with. Um, she said that since 86880 uh, was painted steel that they could have chosen any color to paint it. And so they, they had this idea of maybe using yellow. Um, she said yellow was a serious consideration but they ended up with a paint that was more durable because it used graphite. And so that's the only reason that it turned out black. Black. And that's why black became so fashionable for Mies buildings and others of that era. Um, everyone else we've spoken to uh, absolutely repudiated this, um, but I love to imagine a set of uh, yellow Mies buildings along the Chicago lakefront. Um, coincidentally, the main promotional uh, book for 86880 that is pictured on this slide, we found from 1957 uses yellow as its accent color. Um, it's called The Glass House, A Home for Great living. Um, it includes floor plans and a lot of advertising copy, uh, reassuring prospective tenants about the safety and comfort of living in a contemporary home made of glass. Um, and the variety of interiors uh, pictured is quite interesting. It's obvious that personal tastes and decor hadn't really caught up with the Mies aesthetic quite yet. Um, another person we met with who knew Mies personally and worked with him is his grandson, uh, architect Dirk Lohan. Um, we couldn't resist also asking him about Mies's relationship to color, and he spoke to us about his experience working with Mies on the new National Gallery in Berlin. Um, he assumed there would be white walls onto which art would hang and asked Mies how the space should be divided up for museum exhibits. Um, Mies astonished him by suggesting flexible walls with bright bright primary color shantung silk curtains, uh, red here and blue there, and that's what they did. And it, it looked fantastic, like a Mondrian painting. Um, Dirk said everybody thought that he only liked black and white, um, which is not really true. Um, it's nice to see this flexible grid system and curtains still being used at the new National Gallery even now, like uh, this piece uh, by Thomas Demond, which is a meditation on contemporary Germany. Um, despite touting Mies's love for color, Dirk absolutely discounted even the possibility that Mies would have ever considered yellow for any of his buildings, and he shared some really interesting insights about why the black. Um, Dirk said that Mies's buildings in Chicago were all black because Chicago was a city where all of the heating systems were coal-fired, and there was a lot of soot in the air, with the Union stockyards uh, blowing off the soot all over the city. Um, Dirk reminisced about his first visit to Chicago in 57, and that after a day out in the city, your white collar would turn entirely black. Um, and so Mies observed this and uh, said that it made no sense to paint uh, them any other color because they would turn black anyway. You can see the carbide and carbon building uh, from 1943 here and uh, when it's been uh, cleaned up um, more recently. Um, and that's why when Mies built the Farnsworth house, for example, in the country where there was no color soot, he painted it white. Uh, another important part of our research was to canvas the buildings and photograph every observable detail inside and out. Uh, from the rooftop to the garage, we surveyed and documented 9910 with close attention to their proportions, materials, forms, shadows, and any visible graphic elements, uh, both old and new. Our next step was to uncover any materials relevant to 900-910 we can find in libraries and archives. Um, the Ryerson and Burnham Library at the Art Institute of Chicago was a great resource. Uh, we found a great deal of materials and spent an entire day going through one item at a time, uh, contained in numerous gray archival Mies boxes that were brought to us. Um, one of my favorite discoveries along the way was the photo in the top middle here um, of a building model. And if you look really close, um, you can see Mies's reflection in it. 
Uh, reviewing the newspaper articles about 900-910, we learned more about the planning and construction of 900-910 and of two people in particular who were a big part of the building's narrative. Uh, one was the developer Herbert Greenwald, uh, pictured here with Nice on the left and in the news article. Uh, Greenwald and his partner Samuel Katzen were able to acquire the block just north of 868-80 um, for what was then the highest price ever paid for residential land in Chicago. Uh, completed in 57, 900 then referred to as the Esplanade Apartments, was the first large scale project uh, for which Mises office completed both the design as well as the construction documents. Uh, 900 like 86880, was constructed on a 21 foot column grid. Um, not by coincidence, the 900 towers are sited uh, 21 feet west of the west column uh, center line of 880. Um, there's another detail from the newspaper uh, showing the location where 900-910 would be constructed. Um, from our research, we learned about many elements which distinguish it from its predecessor. Um, because 900-910 was designed five years after 868-80, in the interval, building technology um, had advanced and market demands shifted quite a bit. Uh, and Nice was eager to exploit uh, the new technologies. 900-910 um, was the tallest concrete building yet constructed in Chicago, uh, the first with a flat slab concrete frame. It boasted the city's first air cooling system. Um, it was one of the first unitized anodized aluminum curtain walls and Chicago's first large scale use of tinted heat absorbing glass. Uh, Mises student and later colleague Joseph Fujikawa, uh, pictured to the right of Mises in the photo on the left here, uh, was very active in the 900-910 project. Um, Fujikawa was forcibly relocated to to a Colorado Japanese internment camp during his junior year of college and was there for months before being admitted to IIT where he received his bachelor's and master's degree in architecture. Uh, he was responsible for many of the decisions on the ground uh, during the construction of 900-910, uh, both big and small. For example, he's credited for deciding on including garbage chutes. Um, interestingly enough, Mies uh, thought them unsanitary and left them out at 86880. Um, his associate it's recalled that Mr. Fujikawa wanted to be more like Mies than even Mies himself. Another wonderful resource was the Chicago History Museum, which houses the Hedrick Blessing Photography Archive, which contains many photographs of 900-910, uh, both in construction and after completion. Uh, and MoMA houses the Mies van der Archive, including the original ground floor plan for 900-910, uh, which we carefully studied. So now um, I will walk you through our design process. Um, we began with asking these three questions. What is Mies typography? What, type, what typefaces did Mies himself use? And how would Mies have wanted these buildings branded in the 20th century? With Mies van der Rohe, you have a forest of low hanging fruit ahead of you to navigate, um, but we really believe that Mies had given us everything that we would need for the brand, we just needed to discover it. Massimo Vignelli, who um, considered Mies as his greatest mentor, served as an inspiration um, for us. So we started with looking into Mies' personal history to see what um, typography may have influenced him. And we first found this um, Barron's Medieval from 1914, which was designed by Peter Barron's. Peter Barron's had employed Mies as a architect a few years prior to releasing this typeface. And of course, we looked at the typefaces that were um, used and associated historically with the Bauhaus, but also looked into um, some of the other deeper typefaces that they actually used, like these predecessors to Accidents Grotesque and uh, Venus Grotesque, which um, included condensed and extended weights. When we were speaking with Dirk Lohan, um, one thing he was very adamant though about was that Mies is way over associated with the Bauhaus. He said that Mies was not a student of the Bauhaus and he was only really involved at the diminished ending. So at that point, we decided to turn away from the Bauhaus uh, typography and start to look towards the typography that had been used in the history of the buildings. 
Um, here are some very early uh, examples as far as, you know, an advertisement when the um, apartments were under construction. If you were driving by um, uh, Lakeshore Drive, you would be able to um, see this. We also looked at, you know, obviously here we have some blueprints and the typography, but also the entryway um, type treatment uh, for 900 and 910, uh, which you see the top, which is the original uh, typography, and then the below is the current typography, which is Futura. Now, Futura, like Mies, is incorrectly associated or overly associated with the Bajas. Uh, Paul Renner was also not in the Bajas um, and had no connection to Mies. Here's an example of what the last rebrand of the buildings looked like. In the late 70s, they converted from apartments to condominiums. Um, and this was uh, designed by a uh, advertising firm in New York called the Hoffman Group. Um, interesting, they used the slab serif, I believe is Rockwell for the body copy. While we were canvassing the grounds, um, you know, we looked specifically at all the details, but definitely the topography that was already in existence. On the top, you see the original um, uh, elevator numbers that were preserved uh, along with some typography that has been added to the uh, original mailboxes and a very recent addition of the outside signage. We were also looking at the type that was used by um, to promote the other Mies residential buildings of the time, um, but specifically looking at the typefaces they were choosing. Um, and here specifically the uh, brochure that Sophia had mentioned earlier was using 20th century. Here are two brochures for two other Mies residential buildings that were uh, designed before the buildings were completed. They are only using the architecture models um, and uh, future bold in here, um, which seemed to be a common uh, trend. And of course, and well, we also looked at uh, a number of other Mies promotional materials from around the world and during that time. Now, we had found this book uh, by IIT um, about Mies that we had initially um, assumed was uh, branded in the IIT style. And here's a book from the conversion uh, era from the apartments to condos, and they were using Helvetica. So when we were with and interviewing Dirk Lohan, we asked him specifically what typeface Mies preferred. And he said that everybody in the modern movement liked Helvetica, but that was not Mies. Okay, so what is uh, what was his preferred typeface? And Dirk said Mies and his office used copper plate Gothic. His name was spelled this way in the letterhead, and I wouldn't be surprised if he already had that preference from Europe. Mies van der Rohe, copper plate Gothic, okay. Uh, I did not see that coming. Um, that was really quite a revelation. But we look back and there you go um, on his letterhead or in these invoices, it's Copper Bay Gothic. And that book that we had previously dismissed as um, an IIT brand was actually using Copper Bay Gothic in all caps with justified type for the text. Um, he, yeah, so he looked at it um, and uh, what really was the killer was the one. Um, the ones have to be strong and there is nothing we would be able to do with this. Nice to find out, but damn it. Um, so we had to kind of pivot, but we also looked back at the Barons Medieval from 1914 and put it next to the copper plate and there is some uh, similarities and possibly maybe this is where he picked up that preference. So at this point we had to um, uh, kind of pivot away from what Mies preferred and we asked ourselves, how would Mies like these to be branded for the 21st century? So we explored two different approaches. Uh, the first approach would be in a modernist typographic approach 
um, where we would explore contemporary type treatments that formally relate to the architecture of 900, 910, uh, specifically typefaces that were rational or geometric, precise, and with good proportions. The other option or the other approach would be a Miesian form in a 900 and 910 sense. So we would look at the formal and distinguishing aspects of the buildings and property as uh, inspiration for logo. We considered this quote by Mies as our North Star, uh, create form with the nature, create form out of the nature of the task with the means of our time. This is our work. So we started with um, type studies. And as we looked at the type, we looked for opportunities um, for the typography to represent formal architectural qualities of the buildings. Um, as I mentioned, we were specifically looking at geometric typefaces, but we also looked at uh, square humanist and modern Roman. Um, modern Roman, we thought, could potentially have an unexpected solution with the high contrast and the elegance. While we were working on this project, we were actually in New York City at the Type Directors Club uh, exhibition opening that we had some work uh, on display in. Um, while we were there, we were introduced to typeface desire Tobias Frere Jones. And while we were speaking with Tobias, um, I told him about this project and about the question of what is Mies typography. Uh, Tobias was intrigued and said he uh, had some ideas and invited us to his studio in Park Slope. Once we were there, uh, Tobias and Nina were incredibly generous uh, with their time. Um, we spent the afternoon discussing type. Uh, he showed uh, a typeface that he was currently working on as a personal project. And the typeface was with the appropriate temporary name of Provis Sorium. Uh, this was a stunning, truly modern, modern typeface with square geometric proportions. It feels elegant and industrial. It feels 900, 910. Um, it was so contemporary that uh, Tobias had not finished it yet. Only the caps and the numbers were available at that time. And we only really needed the numbers anyhow. So using Provisorium, we uh, experimented with how we could use the proximity of the type and different formal elements to re um, uh, represent the proximity of the buildings and the connections of the buildings along with a lots of debate on what the orientation of these lines would be. We also looked at using the ampersand um, to represent the covered walkway connecting the two buildings. When you look at the footprint of the buildings, um, it looks like an island. Um, and it's between the, the vast Lake Michigan and the vast quantity of people on Michigan Ave, um, and also right on the corner of Lakeshore Drive where it takes an awkward bend. But what you don't see is uh, that there's an underlying grid. And um, we figured if Mies gives you a grid, why would you not go and try to do something with it? So we experimented with creating new forms and uh, textures with the grid studies um, that came out to some interesting uh, results. Now, one of the most unique features of the buildings are, is the sun deck. Now, if you've ever driven down Lakeshore Drive, you may have thought it was a pool, but I can assure you it is in fact a sun deck. Um, so we wanted to experiment with that form um, in an identity. So here you see the uh, rectangle representing the sun deck, um, the, uh, the column grid from the two buildings and a slash that is uh, representative of Lakeshore Drive going by. Uh, here is a identity study that we did that um, I thought would probably be best for a car that was only available at European airports. Um, and we had another study where we were looking at uh, using the grid column along with the reverse slash for Lakeshore Drive and um, accidents grotesque. And here are some patterns that came out of that treatment. Uh, we also looked at the columns of the building, um, which is not an original idea. Uh, the Via Tugendhat in the Czech Republic uses it in their logo. Uh, the Barcelona Pavilion has a t-shirt with a uh, column available on it. 
And um, the difference though was they were looking at the columns as if you were looking down into the column and we were looking straight ahead. Um, and we kind of like this idea of having a dual meaning with the buildings being separated uh, with the top lines of the columns. We also looked at um, maybe using, uh, acknowledging the original name of the buildings, Esplanade Apartments with a simplified um, uh, type treatment and also had a ampersand identity treatment that uh, we were hoping would kind of uh, reflect a sun rising over one of the buildings. Then we looked at the curtain wall, uh, which is the, one of the most iconic parts of uh, the buildings and developed some type studies that were directly uh, inspired by those. Uh, however, none of these were working. So um, at this point, we took a step back and asked ourselves what separates the visual identities of 900 and 910 and their famous uh, neighbors across the street at 860, 880. Now, obviously, the black windows are um, a big difference, but there's also uh, an important detail. We had early sketches where we were thinking about creating buildings with um, symbolize uh, of with windows, um, but it really wasn't until we spoke with architect and resident Margaret McCurry, who she explained to us that the importance of the window using the golden ratio that was not achievable when they were building 860 and 880. Once we plugged in the proportions into that original sketch, something very measy and started to happen. Um, the next step we had to do is determine the right number and combinations of the windows to uh, properly reflect the buildings. And we had inadvertently made a logo for IIT's uh, Crown Hall while we were doing this. So we ultimately decided on two windows. Um, so you could see them as two buildings, 900 and 910. And this became the secondary association. At this point, we uh, it was time to consider typography. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the um, our approach with rational, geometric, precise, and good proportions as far as type we were looking for. But we also added um, it would we would prefer a German typeface, as they have a strong tradition of rational typefaces and possibly would tie back directly into Mies. In the end, uh, it was a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, DIN, um, we knew DIN would work well. We had no idea how well it would work until we plugged it in. Um, you have a classic industrial German engineer design typeface. It just matched um, the uh, match Mies perfectly. And who would ever dream of arguing with Eric Speakerman? So once we added the... Um, the numbers, uh, they started to resemble the columns that support the buildings, um, which was exciting. However, it caused all sorts of new problems. So, um, you know, we had to separate the numbers somehow, but also there are four columns on the short side of each building and three numbers. So what we were thinking is adding a middle line could serve um, as a column, but also separate the two forms. Now, when we were looking at this, um, some other issues started to arise. For instance, how thick should the lines be? Um, and uh, one thing is if the lines get too thick, the one could be mistaken, I'm sorry, the line could be mistaken for a one. So instead of reading as 900 and 910, it would read as 9,001,910. So we certainly wanted to avoid that. And I would also mention that the kerning was an absolute nightmare as you are dealing with three zeros, two nines, and a one, the one you would have to work around um, no matter what. Once again, we look back to Mies for the answer. Um, and we came to the realization that the vertical and horizontal lines could meet. Um, and this allowed us to borrow the exact window proportions that mimic the bases of the buildings. This was the final chosen identity um, and some of the lockups. Here's an example of the proportions of the windows working with the uh, icon or the identities themselves. And then we came to the implementation of the brand. 
Um, here is a stationary system with the identity uh, that easily converted to a pattern that is used on the letterhead and business cards. The gap in between that uh, interrupts the pattern is uh, representative of the space between the two buildings. Uh, here's an uh, envelope and some internal forms. Um, and we also designed a Microsoft Word template system with style sheets. Um, I, if you really wanted to use style sheets in Word, it is a possibility. Um, so we were able to do it with some sorcery. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, um, but uh, it is possible. Uh, so uh, we wanted to make sure that when we passed over the files to the client, there would be absolute uh, consistency. So we had everything set as far as the type size, styles, and so forth. And we also, you know, when you look around, when you walk around in these Vanderbilt building, you start to realize when you look closely that everything aligns with one another. So we felt that we believe that the brand really lives in precision. And so we had the tabs starting to, uh, they were set to align with different parts of the logo. Uh, one of the most important components of the brand implementation is the new website, which uh, tells the building story. Um, we collaborated with Murmuring on the writing and photography to convey this important and nuanced narrative. Uh, the result was a series of photographs capturing the architecture, but also the spirit of the buildings and their inhabitants. Um, if you're interested to read more about 90910, we recommend visiting the website. It is 90910.com. Um, this is the homepage, which is an overview of the varied content found throughout the site. Um, the legacy page includes historical information and archival photographs of the buildings. Um, we hope in the future to add a digital archive where architects, researchers, and the public can access an even wider array of information and resources. Uh, one of the most unique pages of the website is entitled Reflections. Uh, this is a place where residents can contribute their perspective. Uh, the inaugural piece um, pictured here is by Argaret uh, architect Margaret McCurry. Um, Mar Margaret writes eloquently about her and her late husband, Stanley Tigerman's history, which is very much entwined with Mies and 90910. Um, on the right, um, you can see Margaret's father presenting Mies with the AIA gold medal. Another lovely aspect of Margaret's essay is the last section where she requested other residents of 90910 to contribute their perspectives. Um, they reveal what a unique and special place 90910 has always been and continues to be. Um, as we reflect on this project, we can say with confidence that it's been one of the most profound and rewarding creative experiences we've ever been a part of. Um, and we'd like to uh, dedicate this talk to Brigitte Peterhans, who sadly passed in January near her home in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, being able to spend time with her and share her story was an honor. Um, and thank you, everyone. And we'd love to hear your thoughts or questions. Okay. Thank you very much. That was fabulous. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience? We have a, we have a thank you. Um, hey, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Ben's in New York. Fire away, Ashley. Can you talk about some of the challenges and opportunities of working in, with such an iconic building? That's an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, you know, I think... Um, the opportunity that we realized after our research phase and discovering, you know, that the last rebrand was in the 1970s is that, um, you know, they're such iconic buildings and in many ways they're timeless. And, you know, because the last rebrand was done so long ago and because things were not maintained, there was this opportunity, you know, to uh, raise the level of design, you know, to the level of the um, architectural significance of the buildings. Um, and, uh, you know, we felt a great responsibility. I think it was qu quite heavy at the beginning, you know, because there are such iconic buildings and known worldwide. Um, but it was uh, kind of such, such a pleasure um, because, you know, as we went into a little bit of detail in the presentation, there was just so much to pull from. Um, and, you know, the research phase really allowed us to kind of learn, um, you know, all of these really interesting elements about them that lent themselves so well to be reinterpreted um, uh, 
you know, through design. Um, and what was really novel about the process is that um, we were not um, trying to necessarily market or advertise the buildings, but that the board and residents uh, really wanted to kind of elevate them and really cared and loved about uh, you know, love the building so much. And so it was such a wonderful collaborative and learning process. And, um, you know, we feel that we were, you know, able to uh, hopefully, you know, raise the bar um, in terms of the graphic design, um, you know, for for the space. Um, yeah. And I think um, one of the other challenges was kind of keeping that balance of the forms that Mies had established and also bringing in new content or new um, ideas to it, but avoiding you know, what would be cliche or expected. Um, and there was one thing particularly, you know, I mentioned the Massimo Vignelli's influence. Um, one thing we kept in mind was that every every single mark has to mean something, kind of going back to his philosophy. Um, and I think that was something that it was a good way to go about it, but it certainly ch caused um, some um, unexpected uh, uh, happenings. So, cool. Um, is your work going to be deployed beyond website and collateral, specifically signage and other more permanent on site design elements? Yeah, we, we're um, this is going to be an ongoing process. Uh, you know, we started before COVID. Um, there was actually the original plan was to do more of the um, uh, print collateral and the um, signage first before the website, but because of COVID, uh, we turned that uh, around just to be as efficient as possible um, as it would be to get people there and uh, so forth to be able to do the research on site was just not, um, uh, no one really had the appetite for that at that time, so. Um, so, you know, we're, we're really excited. There's um, going to be, there's a lot of signage, um, both kind of practical signage, wayfinding in the garage, and also um, on the entryway, on the windows. Um, and there's a lot of uh, opportunity for um, print collateral. We're going to be putting together uh, brand standards as well. So uh, we're really excited now to um, begin to implement it beyond, uh, beyond just the website itself. Wonderful. I mean, when do you, when do you think the, the signage piece of it might take place? Has there been, been any predictions yet? Yeah, it, um, it's going to be starting, the process is starting in May, so. Um, oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. Um, what was the duration of the redesign and how did you stay motivated to keep finding the right typeface after rejecting so many other possible typefaces? <laughs> um, <laughs> All in all, it was about 15 months. Um, uh, and, you know, with me, I mean, we knew from the onset, we're both, you know, students of modernism. And if you can't get excited to do a Mies van der Rohe project, um, uh, <laughs> you may want to consider accounting or some other profession. Because um, we knew it when it came to us that it was uh, a once in a lifetime sort of uh, opportunity that would be looked upon by a lot of people. So there is kind of keeping that um, pressure separate from uh, and out of our head was kind of a challenge, but um, it was, uh, you know, I remember working when we were working specifically on the creative and just like, just stopping to like, remember this is fun. You know, this is, this is why we do. <laughs> do. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was really um, kind of the motivating at least on my behalf, let me share the thoughts on that. Yeah, and we just we just enjoy process so much and we have a collaborative process between the two of us where we work separately and then come back together and we thoroughly enjoy that. Um, and as also uh, both of us being educators, um, you know, we um, really um, kind of thrive and enjoy uh, the process and not just the end result. And so I feel like um, there was not frustration, but kind of a coming together of all of our ideas that really kind of really authentically led us to the end result. Um, yeah. Great. And then a piggybacking off of that, did this project spoil you? <laughs> what would your reaction be if you were asked to brand to brand a project with a less distinguished pedigree or 
in parenthesis, or just a plain crummy building. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it, it did spoil us in terms of, uh, you know, having a lot of resources and collaborating, you know, again, with a people that really cared for yeah. the building and were really invested. I think that in that way, it was a really unique client relationship, um, really different than, than how we've uh, worked in the past. Um, but, um, you know, any, any project that we take on, um, uh, you know, I, I always think only boring people are bored. And so I think regardless of the building, um, I think uh, we would, through our research process, um, kind of find an angle and find something that is interesting or fascinating or novel about it and a way to distinguish it, you know, depending on, again, what the, what the client brief might be. Um, you know, in this case, it was just elevating, you know, the buildings um, uh, kind of historically and having them be more visible and uh, kind of less of any kind of marketing or financial motivation, which, um, you know, was, was also a really nice breath of fresh air. Yeah. And that's the thing too, is um, one of their biggest, one of the client's biggest issues when it started was that, you know, people would come from around the world to go see Mies van der Rohe buildings in Chicago and would go to across the street and take photos, but they wouldn't even think to turn around and there was two more across the way. So we were trying to elevate, um, these buildings to that level of um, notoriety that, you know, his other work has, um, because they have been overlooked, um, just more or less, because I think of the timing of uh, them being built um, has affected that. But um, you know, that was kind of the challenging, but also fun part is if, you know, we were going to be doing one, uh, rebranding one of his more famous buildings, you know, for instance, 860, 880, you know, every single Mies van der Rohe book has a chapter on those, on those buildings. You're lucky to find a paragraph in the, uh, his entire biography about these two buildings. So that was, I guess, to answer the question, if, you know, these crummy buildings, uh, if they had an interesting story, um, it would be kind of, um, you know, something we could be interested in, but if it's just, you know, a warehouse or something, I guess, probably not. <laughs> In other words, there, there are no small parts, only small actors. So that was yeah. the expression. <laughs> and if they had the right budget, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> well, I suppose that helps. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions here where people are interested to know um, what the vetting process was like when you were being interviewed for the project. Yeah, um, they had put out a RFP um, and uh, we actually were, um, we are members of the Arts Club of Chicago and one of the um, uh, residents uh, Sophia had become friends with and had, they gave us a heads up on the RFP. Um, but the way we approach the proposal was, you know, we stayed away from the cliches where we're talking about less is more and God is in the details. And we more spoke about the feeling that you get of the perfect proportions of a Mies van der Rohe room. Um, and the way it's, you know, you feel in there and talk more like that instead of, you know, talking about the different things that Mies had said or, you know, has been, you know, kind of um, reset too many times. Um, but there, there were three design firms, I believe, that the client uh, narrowed it down to, um, including ourselves, and then we were um, eventually uh, chosen for the project. I think um, being a small studio um, allowed us to work um, much more hands-on on the project. And so we were, we felt we were a really good fit for that reason as well. And we do all the creative work ourselves. Um, and so it, um, I think really suited our, our process um, and our um, educational background um, really suited, um, you know, what, what the client was looking for. Okay. Right. Um, this is kind of funny. I, what conclusions did you draw from the fact that Mies used copper plate on this letterhead? Did it change your opinion of him in any way? You know, I mean, I, I hate to say this because they may take away my modernist card, but you know, like maybe he really wasn't in the modernism himself. Um, you know, his his grandson told us uh, that he never lived in any of his own buildings, um, and uh, the urban legend was that he had all this art that his own buildings didn't have the wall space for, 
But he said, in fact, he didn't live in his own buildings because he didn't want to get stuck in the elevator with tenants that would be complaining about the plumbing and so forth. So, um, you know, that's where I kind of, it's kind of interesting. I mean, the copper plate thing, as I said, I wasn't really, I was floored by that. And one thing that Dirk Lohan also did say is that, you know, Meads got very um, irritated with the whole new typography, not using capital letters thing to, um, but then copper plate only had capital letters because I guess in German, the capital letters mean much more, are much more significant than in English. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I mean, I was stunned by that. Um, I really didn't expect that, uh, you know, um, cause that's the thing too, in that era, you were dealing a lot with just like whatever typeface, you know, the printer had. So like stuff like the, the advertisement on the building under construction, that was probably just a font that, you know, whatever the sign maker had, but um, yeah, I don't know. it was, it was just, I mean, it was exciting to find that out, but it was disappointing just to see how limit limited it was going to be. Um, so uh, gives you a completely different perspective on the person. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the thing too, is that it made us, um, it wasn't, it, the, as we went through this process, it became less about me and more about the buildings themselves. So like that was kind of like, okay, we have to put this kind of aside and then kind of look back at what the building's um, uh, identity really demanded. Right. <laughs> let it go. Um, <laughs> let me see. Is there one more here? Oh, this is an interesting one. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, maybe we need to fill it, fill it in the blanks a little bit. Was this your personal favorite solution? So, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think it was the most successful solution. Um, the client had uh, um, basically, you know, we presented three, um, the only two were uh, really under debate and that was the Tobias uh, typeface and then the one that was ultimately chosen. Um, it would have been fun personally and so in a selfish way to have the Tobias one be chosen just because it was such a new typeface and that was really exciting to be able to have something that was so new and different. Um, uh, but then again, it was, I think it was too far of a, a stretch for the clients um, as far as uh, identifying the buildings themselves. And the, you know, the other one is just, uh, the one that was chosen is, is so spot on and so versatile. And um, I, th I think that, you know, I would, you know, I, I, that was not a surprise that they chose that, that one way anyways. Okay. Do you have a favorite? Uh, I, I, I liked both for different reasons and kind of back to that question that we asked of like, what would Mies do, um, you know, if, he Thanks was here. around now um, and, you know, looking back at his quotes and his philosophy, kind of the um, Tobias's typeface was more in the realm of instead of using type from that time, uh, really using the means of our time, as he says in his quote. Um, and so using something contemporary, um, you know, was what Mies was doing in his lifetime. And so that option was exciting for that reason. Um, and the other option, um, because it just identified with the black and with the proportions of the windows that were the golden ratio. I mean, there's just such a beauty in that. And um, it identifies those specific buildings themselves so well. Um, and so uh, I would I would say those those two were my favorite. Uh, they were a tie for me, um, but I, I think um, the final identity we're um, so pleased with. And as we began to implement it, um, you know, there's just um, uh, boundless opportunities and how it works with the pattern and the grid of the buildings. Um, so we're, we're very pleased with it. Okay. Um... So there's, there's one, I'm sorry, there's one uh, last question here, which is kind of unusual. Um, it's referring to the typeface that's used on Mises' tombstone. Hmm. Uh, we are right down the street from where he lies, but uh, we haven't been there since we've been working on it. Um, we've been over there before. It's quite beautiful um, uh, and famous uh, cemetery, but I, don't recall. I believe it's in all caps, sans serif, but I, I don't know if that's what's I don't know. I, yeah. 
Uh, but he is in Graceland in a really beautiful spot overlooking water uh, there. Um, we wanted to um, go in the winter time uh, to pay him a visit, but we didn't make it um, during the talk. <laughs> cool. Okay. Uh, well, there is uh, the the person has provided a link in the Q and A, so everybody's welcome to go and click on it and take a look at it. Um, I believe that's that is all the questions we have. So I want to thank you both for for coming. Uh, it was a terrific talk. And Carol, you have anything you want to add before we go? No, I think that um, it was absolutely wonderful. And uh, I enjoyed it immensely. It was very, very interesting. So thank you so much. And I hope to get to see everybody at our conference on May 7th and 8th, Type Drives Community. So thank you. And again, Dan and Sophie, so good to see you. And lots of luck with the baby. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. We hope to see you all soon in New York soon. I hope so, really. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you to all of the attendees. Take care. Bye-bye.